Hey there friends, Dave Politis, KM Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. We're in the library and it has been raining all day, two days in a row now. But it's good. It's good because up in northern Montana when we don't get rain this time of the year we get fires uh, in the summer. And the good thing is we're ahead of schedule. Things are green, reservoirs are filling. It's looking good up here. And uh, I am praying that we have a smoke-free summer. So this is a missing persons edition. And this is a special edition of Missing 411. And uh, the last time I did one was I did the Michigan aerial disappearances. It's kind of where I bring things together that have a common denominator and I think you're going to be intrigued by this and it'll be a theme that I'll carry through uh, towards the end of the letters so hang in there this is important that you you kind of go with it I've talked to you uh, a lot in the past about a new site that I'll eventually go to I'm still looking for the right site to land on I've spent hours talking to different people from different platforms. Some platforms do not come out and tell you that they are owned by Google, but upon doing research, they are. It's just another YouTube, YouTube with the same restrictions and the same censorship. So you have to do the research. Other platforms claim that they have monetization and they really don't. And they, as an example, let's, let's just say YouTube pays you a dollar. Well, their site will pay you two cents. <laughs> Not worth it. Another example. I'm looking for a site that has unlimited upload. Meaning a lot of sites will tell you, okay, yeah, you can join us and you can upload your videos, but they can only be 20 minutes long. Well, that doesn't work for the storytelling that we do. It has to be in 4K, not 1080, because a lot of the locations I film in, the beauty behind it is the 4K. I want to have live streaming, and here's the reason for that. I'm going to go to a subscriber-based platform. I have to. It's the only way I can make it. And those subscribers have to have some special privileges. One of those special privileges is I'm going to do live streaming, hopefully Q and A's and the site I'm going to has to have that. And lastly, if a site claims that they have monetization, then they're going to have to prove to me that it's at least somewhat comparable to what YouTube is doing. Otherwise I won't do it and we'll just go subscriber. I understand a lot of you are pushing me certain directions to platforms that you're comfortable with or you've joined, and I get that. But the reality is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take a second rate platform just to to do it. I've spent too much time, too much time researching different locations, etc. So let's uh, let's go right to the letters. First one. Hey Dave, some facts here I'd like to share. After doing some quick research on this, you won't believe it. So since Russia attacked Ukraine in 2022, the following things have happened. And let's go with them. January 5th, Nebo Road poultry plant in Hamilton Mountain, Ontario. Massive fire. January 14th, Cargill, Cargill Freed Mill in Lecompte, California. Massive fire. January 14th, same day, Van Duren Farms plant in Muncie in Moments, Illinois, massive fire. January 21st, Washington Potato Company in Warden, Washington, massive fire. February 3rd, Wisconsin River Meats plant in Mouston, Wisconsin, massive fire. February 16th, Louisville Dreyfus LDC soybean processing plant in Claypool, Indiana, massive fire. February 16th, same day, Bonanza Meat Company in El Paso, Texas, massive fire. February 28th, Shearer's Foods in Hamilton, Oregon, a huge potato chip plant, massive fire. March 3rd, Shearbrook 
Foods plant in Montreal, California. Massive fire. This is what they sent me. I haven't proofed all of this yet, although I've seen a lot of it. March 13th, Nestle's Frozen Foods, maker of Hot Pockets in Jonesboro, Arkansas, massive fire. March 14th, Carrefour Foods in Taiwan, massive fire. March 16th, Walmart Fulfillment Center in Plainfield, Indiana, massive fire. March 28th, Maricopa Food Pantry in Maricopa, Arizona, massive warehouse fire. March 30th, Penobscot McCrum Potato Plant in Belfast, Maine, massive fire. Rio Fresh Agrifarm Plant in Texas, massive fire. April 11th, East Conway Beef Pork Plant in Conway, New Hampshire, massive fire. April 13th, Gem State Processing Potato Plant in Hayburn, Idaho, massive fire. April 13th, same day, Taylor Foods Vegetable Plant Supplier in Grower Warehouse in Salina, California, massive fire. Easier Standard HQ Organics and Grain Supply in Morrow, Oregon, massive fire. April 24th, General Mills Cereal Plant in Covington, Georgia, massive fire. Conspiracy? Question mark. In 2021, there were also fires like these all year at food plants and distribution centers. Eight were listed. I don't know what's going on there. Just giving you the facts. But I will tell you this. Be prepared. We are the village. We need to help ourselves. And we need to be prepared. Prepared for the worst. That way, if it hits, you're going to be sitting there pretty. I wouldn't tell anybody. I just keep my mouth shut, load up my garage, my basement, and be ready to be self-sufficient without electricity, without anything. It's the only way you're going to be able to do it. And you're going to say, well, Dave, uh, are we going to have natural gas or propane? Nope, nope, nope. If it gets really bad, you're not going to have anything. That's just the way it is. Look at the people in the Ukraine. Think about what they have. They have nothing. And they're barely making it. In some cases, they're not making it. Now, I don't expect war, but I do expect that if things get really bad, then your neighbors are going to try to come through your door. So you better be able to protect yourself. And uh, if you don't know how to use a firearm, I would look to use one and get one and get trained with it. And you can't have a gun unless you're willing to use it. Otherwise, it'll be taken from you and used against you. So, I don't, I don't try to instill fear, preparedness. There's a big difference. Uh, like I've said before, in California, we were always prepared because we had big earthquakes there all the time. And the USGS would always tell us, say, you'd be prepared for at least a week with no food and water. And we always were. And uh, you never know when a natural disaster is going to hit, or you never know when a man-made disaster like we're living through right now will continue on. So, next letter. <clears throat> Hi, Dave. While watching one of your past videos, I took special interest when you mentioned an elk hunter who had heard a strange humming noise while walking down a trail. If I remember correctly, the hunter wisely decided to turn around. After hearing of this hunter's experience, I decided to write you, but other duties diverted me. However, your video of 427.22 redirected my attention, and I feel as though I should relay this simple account from my early teen years. Quite frankly, it was the excellent letter you read from a villager concerning the possibilities related to weather anomalies that compelled me to write. Good. Back in the 60s, my folks owned a farm in a thinly settled part of Lawrence County, South Carolina. And much of my time there was spent roaming the woods and fields with my 22 rifle. On a hot August afternoon in 64, I was in the woods as usual when I began hearing a low continuous sound. My perception soon came to be that of a large swarm of honeybees. I didn't know where, but it just sounded like it. I was familiar with the sound of the bees, and they swarmed because of my grandfather that kept hives nearby. I thought it odd that they'd be swarming at this time of the year, but could think of no other reasonable explanation. We were always on the lookout for a wild hive to incorporate into Granddad's beekeeping operation, 
or just to rob for a portion of their honey. I had already found one hive in a hollow tree the year before, a bee tree, and recall them. With that thought in mind, I began heading towards where the sound was coming from, but upon arriving there, the sound seemed to be a, to have moved. I repeated this maneuver several times, but the sound kept moving farther and farther from home. At least that was the perception. There wasn't a breeze stirring back in the woods, and the heat was becoming unbearable, so after a while I tired of it and got tired of following the sound. I remember feeling a bit queasy a couple times during my search, but nothing out of the ordinary happened other than my hair staying on, standing on end at one point. Dave, whatever was making that sound, it certainly wasn't a swarm of honeybees. I returned to the house and told my dad what I'd heard and that my search for the sounds was fruitless. Without hesitation, dad said, you'd never find it, adding, it's best not to try or you may end up getting lost. He then added that should I ever hear the noise again, I was to get out of the area immediately. As it turned out, dad as well as others he knew had heard the same sound years earlier and yet come to his own conclusion as to what caused it. For part of his career, Dad was in charge of maintaining the electrical system in a large industrial plant, and his conclusion was that the sound we had both heard was electrical in nature. Something oddly akin to the high-voltage power line, coronal discharge known as mains hum. Dad then went on to describe how he... Dad went on to describe to me how lightning strikes were comprised of two-part charge, positive and negative, part from the sky and part from earth. Years later, I would see how motion footage of lightning strikes and realize that part of the bolt came up from earth and joins the part coming from the sky. Dad theorized that when the conditions were just right, the earth somehow acts as a capacitor, which stores a tremendous amount of electricity, the positive part of the lightning bolt. At the end of our discussion, he added, there will be an electrical storm here in a little while. I've never known it to fail when that sound was in the area. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Sure enough, within the hour a storm was approaching. The actual storm was still some distance away and before the first drop of rain fell, there was a tremendous lightning strike up in the area of the woods where I had searched for the humming sound earlier. Some years later, during the mid-70s, I was up in that area where I thought that strike had occurred back in August of 64. And there, to my surprise, I found a strange circle on the forest floor. I estimated it to be 18 feet in diameter, almost perfectly round, and lined about with small pines in the middle of mature hardwood forest. There wasn't a single thing growing inside that circle except lush green grass about four inches tall. The rest of the forest floor was covered in leaf litter and devoid of any grass. I visited the spot several times during the following years, but never once did I set foot inside the circle. It was totally out of place. As to the strange sound, I have no idea what other anomalies might manifest in such a highly charged environment. Or at the instant a strike occurs, I only know that it wasn't a, I only know that it isn't a safe place to be. I hope that sharing this experience might help some among our villagers to keep themselves safe from harm should they ever encounter this strange humming when afield. Thanks for all your hard work, Dave, along with your utterly honest and objective approach. Best wishes. To me, that's pretty interesting. <clears throat> when I was up in Northern California 12, 14 years ago doing research in Hoopa, I was directed to a family who had a sighting at their house way up in the middle of nowhere. And after I interviewed them, I asked them, they were elderly, real elderly, and I asked them if I could walk their property. And they said, oh yeah, go ahead. As I was walking the property, it's about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, it's beautiful. And I felt this loud hum, like vibration come from the ground. And it lasted I don't know, 10, 10 minutes or so. And I walked different directions from where I first felt it. And I f it was felt everywhere, within a hundred feet at least of where I first felt it. I went back to the family and explained what I experienced. And they said, yeah, 
We experience the same thing. Sometimes a couple times a day, usually at least once a day. Times aren't consistent, but it definitely comes from Earth. Well, just so you know, this isn't a volcanic area. There's no volcanoes near it. And it's a, uh, it's a wooded, thickly wooded area. Very odd, very odd. Never experienced since. Don't know. Okay, next letter. Hi Dave, I got goosebumps right now. I'm watching your YouTube channel and I just talked about a mountain biker who had something following him on a trail. My name is Blank and I live a few miles south of Holly, Michigan in the town of Clarkston. I have ridden at Holbridge many times as it's my own trail. I'm part of an Ottawa Indian, O-D-A-W-A, not that really means anything, but I think I'm in tune with things a little more than your normal person. I've had numerous feelings out on the trail. Not necessarily that I'm in danger or anything like that. Something is just different. A few winters ago, I was out riding my bike after dark in the winter, and I had a snowy owl fly right towards me, almost hitting me in the head. I have two really bright lights I use at night riding, one on my bike and one on my helmet. The owl was absolutely silent. It was really awesome. Thought it was a once in a lifetime thing. So I went riding again the next evening and the exact same thing happened. Okay, so I thought I have to look into this. Since I'm a Chippewa, Ottawa Indian, did a little research and found out that owls can be bearers of bad news. And a few weeks later, my girlfriend found out that she had cancer and passed away a year later. Anyway, since I found your channel, needless to say, I've been, it's been eye-opening. I've had other things happen while hunting in the Huron National Forest near Glenny, Michigan. Like hearing a loud voice telling me to get up before I'm heading out or to a hunting spot, etc. Never have felt dread or anything like that. Always feeling of a calm. Well, thank you for doing what you do. So sorry about your son. I can't imagine how you've gone through that. Best wishes. Thank you. So we've talked about that radar inside your head and everyone's different. And I do think that Native Americans are tuned in a little more to the land and they're especially their reservation than we are. It's like Native told me one time, Dave, you walk in the woods in bare feet. You feel the land and it feels you. This was a very old elder who had probably walked 90% of his life in bare feet. And I thought about that. I said, there might be something to it. Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm a big fan of your work and I've wanted to reach out to you for some time. Watch your story of the gold rush guy in Idaho who just stopped what he was doing and ran straight into the woods. And the story about the guy in the snowmobile who took a left turn and just keep going. So I decided to take a chance and share my experience. Please don't mention my name. They say people lost in the woods take their clothes off because of hypothermia. But I have an experience many years ago that makes me think it's something entirely different. And here's my story. I grew up in a small town and tributary of Charles River, Massachusetts. There really isn't anything there in the late 70s, not like it is now. I was 14 years old and was cutting through a state forest area after school, right around your 4 p.m. marker. It was a bright autumn day. I would followed these paths many times, so it was no big deal. But that day was the last day I ever passed through there again. I was walking along, minding my own business, as they say, just daydreaming as any teenager would do, when I realized all the birds and woodland sounds had suddenly stopped. I froze in my tracks and looked around because I had happened, it had happened so abruptly. I got this heavy feeling that I wasn't alone. That's the only way I can describe it. The woods suddenly got darker also, and that would really creep me out because I knew it was a crisp, clear day. This was no different than any others. Clouds weren't even overhead. 
I didn't see any wonder or anything, but this is low buzzing noise started and somehow or something was giving me an overwhelming urge to take off my clothes. I felt compelled to. And I had no control over what I was doing. It was like I was being possessed by some force I didn't understand. Just then, for some reason, I remembered the Nicene Creed from CCD classes. The part about, quote, all that is seen and unseen. So I started praying out loud, and in a few moments, it was like I was walking from a dream. And the woods lit up again, and I was sitting on the trail, half undressed with one shoe on. I grabbed my stuff and ran out of there, back the way I came. I've only told a few people this story in the 40 plus years since it happened because I know how insane it sounds. Someone told me I might have had an epileptic seizure or some kind of fit because of the buzzing. But I know full well something had broken into my mind and ordered me to take off all your clothes. So every time I hear that often repeated hypothermia explanation, I'm reminded that a 14 year old kid again. I know how way out there this all sounds, but it happened to me and I escaped it, whatever it was. There and unseen forces at hand in many of these disappearances. Are they demonic, supernatural, cryptid? I haven't a clue. But there is a weirdness woven through every one of your missing 411 reports that is the common denominator. So they can't be any weirder than my experience those years ago. That's a weird story. But I've heard similar stories several times from people who have never watched my channel and have never known that this exists. I don't know what it is. I don't know what could be causing it, but I think it's something real. Hello, Mr. Politis. I'm writing you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, this is about religion. And I read this, what this woman sent me twice. This is going to lead directly into the stories I'm going to talk to you about. So start paying, please, very close attention. I know you're always paying attention. Uh, the message is in two parts. My first concern is losing loved ones in death. I wish to extend my deepest condolences to you and your family and your sudden loss of your son. I know from having lost loved ones in death, that death stings. This is a deep stab wound that heals time, over time, but leaves a deep scar, like a war wound. I'm writing to you to share what I have learned from the Bible that helps me to cope. I was born a Catholic and became a Jehovah's Witness in midlife. Here are the three most important things that I learned when I read this in I think it's worth listening to. Death is not normal for humans. It was not part of the plan. We were not created to die, but to, but to live forever. She cites a section. He has even put eternity in your heart. This is why we can't imagine the world without ourselves in it. And why carrying on alone in the world after a loved one dies is so absurd and painful. We are meant to live forever on the earth, surrounded by our loved ones. It feels that way. And when you think of life on earth without you, it doesn't seem right. Our lost loved ones are in a state of non-existence. The Bible compares death to deep sleep. In the state of coma, they are not aware of what is happening in the world. If we look at their... If we look at the uh, account, account of the Lazarus in the Bible, we learn many things. Jesus' friend Lazarus has died, but Jesus said that he had fallen asleep and that he was going to awaken him. Check it out for yourself, John 11, verse 11, 13, and 14. Mary and Martha warned Jesus that his body had surely begun to smell. The raising of Lazarus was done before over 500 witnesses. When Lazarus was raised back to life, he made no mention of having gone to heaven or any other place. He had no remembrance of what had happened to him. This proves that the dead are in a state of non-existence. They can't work or plan or acquire knowledge or wisdom anymore. 
This places them in a very safe place, God's perfect memory. This takes us to point three. Our loved ones will be brought back to life here on earth at the time of the resurrection. The master creator of the genome is capable of recreating the genetic makeup of every human being that has ever walked the earth and return them on her every memory of every thought or experience that they have ever had. And in his word, he tells us that the yearns to do just that. And furthermore, he has made it as a promise to us. How do we know that our loved ones will be resurrected to life on earth and not in heaven? Because of several promises. Psalms 37, which you can check for yourself, states that it is the earth that righteous will possess and live for us forever. Part B. The second part concerns spirit creatures, as described in the Bible. All spirit creatures, or angels, were created by God individually. They were created before the earth, and they watch as God created our beautiful earth. They were not made to reproduce or have families, so they do not enjoy the privilege. Only humans would be given that privilege. They were, however, given free will, just as humans were. God did intend for angels or humans to God did intend for angels or humans to be robots. Satan is one of these creatures. He was originally an obedient, but became envious and vain and turned bad. He influenced some of the angels to follow his ways, and bad ones are referred to in the de as demons in the Bible. Angels and demons have been allowed on the earth, as is clear from the book of Job. However, Bible chronology shows that Satan and his demand have now been cast out to the heaven. Earth was not created for angels, it was created for man. Angels are very powerful creatures. An angel under God's direction wiped out an entire army in one night. On that night, the angel of Jehovah went out and struck down 185,000 men in a camp of the Assyrians. I remember these stories in Sunday school. Demons, bad angels, can fool humans. And no wonder, for Satan himself keeps disguising himself as an angel of light. They are in the vicinity of the earth, and this time they can transform into angels of light. I leave you to imagine how people can be fooled by this, and how it may be an explanation for people being lured silently away. Remember, dead loved ones are only alive in God's memory, yet people say they can see their loved ones appear to them. Could it be demons taking on the form of their dead loved ones to fool them? I direct you to the JW.org website. It is a Bible-based website that you can browse free of charge to research questions of all kinds in over 600 languages last time I checked. Please keep safe. The pandemic may not be over. I'm writing you in the name of both my husband and myself. Some of you may not understand why I read that, but I think that, that it's important. There, there are many miracles listed in the Bible, and I know there's many of you who want nothing to do with it, and I'm not trying to push my will on you, but I think you need to understand some things. And this person did an excellent job laying out several of them that I wanted to communicate. Now, the next three stories I'm going to tell you about people disappearing all involve one religion. Leaders of one religion. I can't find three stories of disappearances of one religion other than this one. Now, before I tell you the stories, they're about the Episcopalians. And I wanted to do a little background on them. And this is what I pulled off their website for you. We Episcopalians believe in a loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a constituent members of the Anglican Communion in the United States, we are descendants of and partners with the Church of England and the Scottish Episcopal Church. 
<coughs> and are part of the third largest group of Christians in the world. We believe in following the teachings of Jesus Christ, whose life, death, and resurrection saved the world. We have a legacy of inclusion, aspiring to tell and exemplify God's love for every human being. Women and men serve as bishops, priests, and deacons in our church. Lay people and clergy cooperate as leaders, uh, leaders at all levels of our church. Leadership is a gift from God and can be expressed by all people in our church, regardless of sexual identity or orientation. We believe that God loves you, no exemptions. So, in 14 years of doing this, it, the stories I'm about to tell you came at different times. It wasn't like I was looking for disappearances from any religion. But in this one, in this special edition, we're going to talk about one group who lost three leaders, as bizarre as that sounds. First one, A.M. Burroughs, 70 years old, went missing September 29th, 1928, West Cliff, Colorado. He was the pastor of the Episcopal Church in West Cliff. He was visiting a place called Pines Ranch, and it's still Pines Ranch Resort if you look it up. He left in the morning to walk to his church in Westcliff. He never made it. Uh, parishioners realized he didn't show up, called his daughter in Grand Junction. She called friends in the area. Ranchers, volunteers, and sheriffs all came out. Now, let me uh, explain to you a little bit about this area because I think it's greatly important that you understand. Now, this is the Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado. This is the Swatch Valley of Colorado. This is Crestone. This is Westcliff, the destination, and this is the resort he was staying at. So here's the resort, the ranch, and this is the city. It's seven miles. Now, as I've stated to you a hundred of times, nobody walks a straight seven miles through the woods. Probably walk 12 miles. Well, when he left, he would made that trek many times in his life. He was in good health and he liked the outdoors. But when he didn't make it, all the ranchers, parishioners, sheriff, firefighter, forest service, everybody in the area, they closed the businesses in Westcliff for three days and they searched this track of land. Everybody loved Pastor Burroughs, everyone. Now, you may not know this, and I didn't until I did research about it because a friend of mine moved to the Swatch Valley. And I just looked it up to see what it was about. Do you know it has been rated the number one UFO hotspot in North America, the Suwatch Valley. Now, I have a friend that lives in Crestone, right at the base of these mountains. These mountains are very abrupt and very steep. UFOs all the time in this area. There's UFO videos above Sand Dunes National Park. I wrote about a disappearance in Sand Dunes National Park of a little boy. This whole area it's filled with intrigue and unusual things. I'm telling you, it is a very, very strange place. This whole valley and this mountain range. Now, Burroughs' search went on for four days. They found nothing. And they knew that was strange. Some people thought that Pastor Burroughs fell off a cliff and died. Except the area from where he left to where he was going, there was a very defined road. 
Now, some people thought he may have went cross-country, but even cross-country, the mountains weren't as steep as they were behind the resort. So the thought was, publicly, it was stated that he fell off a cliff and died. Why didn't they find the body? Uh, there was a, a lot of water in that area, but he was never found. A.M. Burroughs, 70 years old, missing on September 29th, 1928. Now, I've talked to some of you before about this next case, but since this is about a special cluster of missing people, you're going to get this again. I'm going to talk to you about an individual named William Faber, 74 years old, missing July 20th, 1934 about six years after Burroughs disappeared. Now, William Faber was raised in Buffalo, New York, and became a pastor in the Episcopal Church in the New York area at two different locations. In 1910, he came to Montana and became the head of the Episcopal Church in Montana. He was an outdoorsman, he liked to hike, hiked regularly, he was very healthy. Uh, even though he was old. He loved going to Glacier and he had been here many, many times. Bishop Faber. So on uh, July 16th, 1934, he arrived at Glacier National Park with his assistant, Reverend Lee Young. He accompanied Faber when he climbed Mount Henry the next day inside the park. On July 19th, Lee had to return to Great Falls. This left Faber alone at his Two Medicine Chalet. This was a hotel in the park. Two Medicine Chalet sits on Two Medicine Lake. And this was a very, very nice look nice location in 1934. Well, on July 20th, uh, uh, Bishop Faber told people that it was an hour before dinner that he was going to take a short hike and he'd be back in time for dinner. Well, he didn't make it back. Let me show you where this is. This is the eastern side of Glacier National Park. And over here is where I live, over Columbia Falls Way. And this is the western entrance to the park. Travel over here and come in the eastern entrance. Faber was staying at Two Medicine in this area, right on the lake. Absolutely stunning location. Stunning. <laughs> <coughs> I understand why he likes like going there. So it's an hour before dinner, Faber, t Faber tells the people, hey, I'll be back, time for dinner. So he doesn't come back. The people in the hotel immediately notify National Park Service, and the next day a big search is started. Now they know he was coming back for dinner. They know he knows this area like the back of his palm, because he's been here so many times. So they realize they're going to hike out 30 minutes and he's going to be inside of that area because 30 minutes out, 30 minutes back, there's your hour and he's there for dinner. Well, they did that the first two days and they weren't finding anything. And that was really odd. They said that was not like him. He was always very punctual and he was very healthy. So they weren't really worried about his health. On July 23rd, the third day of the search, they pushed out further. And one ranger was three hours out with other rangers, and they'd split an area up. And he was one mile off the only trail in the area, and he was walking a creek line. And he came across Bishop Faber with his shoulders, shoulders and head above the water, deceased like a pillar. And it was described as one of the most unusual things you can imagine seeing. He was dead. And they also said that his shoulders and his head were dry. 
So his body was recovered, taken out by the National Park Service, and he was taken to a coroner who determined he died from shock and exposure. He did not die from drowning. Now, he's in water. He's three hours away from the lodge. This meant that if he had made that trip and he was coming back, he would have been hiking in the dark, which nobody did that in 1934 because nobody had, had headlights. And also, there were deadly animals in the park back then as there are now. The thought that Faber did that and hike that far out was very, very hard to understand. I think many people were reluctant to say and bring out the issues that I have just told you. That it's a very, very bizarre situation to try to explain. And you also think about the 411 research. Remember, that Reverend Lee Young had left the day earlier. His companion, the person who kind of looked after him. The day he leaves, the following day, this happens. Again, very, very unusual timing. The next story. The story's in my books. I did a ton of research on this. Because when I first started to read it, I couldn't believe what I was reading. It's the story of James Pike, 56 years old, disappeared September 1st, 1969, in Israel. And you think, Dave, why are you talking about Israel? Hold on, cowboy. James was raised in Berkeley, a place near and dear to my heart since I went to school there. And every article I read about him said he showed brilliance when he was young. His younger years were at Berkeley, later years were spent in Los Angeles. He did super well in school and he was invited to attend Yale Law School. Friends, that is not easy. You gotta be really good to get in there. Well, he graduated near the top of his class and he became an SEC lawyer. Securities and Exchange Commission lawyer. Well, as he got older, he showed more and more interest in religion. Well, he attended the Union Theological Seminary. And after Eisenhower was president, he became the president of Columbia University and he appointed James as the chaplain there at the school. Well, in 1958, he became, James became the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of California, a huge position. In 1966, James invited Martin Luther King to attend Grace Cathedral in San Francisco to speak. If you've never been to Grace Cathedral, you need to go. It's quite a location. But it shows that James was at the cutting edge of the thinking of modern day society back in the 60s. Well, he professed while he was in San Francisco that he was accepting of lesbians, gays. It didn't matter to him. They were all people and he was an accepting type. Well, when James, James had a son and later in life, his son, took his life at a hotel in San Francisco or in New York. This shook his world tremendously. And in many interviews, he stated that his son had contacted him in a paranormal way over the years. And then he went on to study life after death. 
with an organization headed by a woman who we'll call Diane. James requested from the church that he be allowed to marry Diane, and they said no. Well, he did marry her, and he was still preaching in the Episcopal Church. And in 1969, he and Diane were doing research on a book about Christ and the Judean wilderness near the Dead Sea. Why did Christ go there? And that was one of the reasons that James wanted to go. Now, first of all, if you understand the intellect of this man to begin with, and the thoroughness of his research and his heart, hard to find these kind of people. So, here's the Dead Sea. Here's Jerusalem. This is Israel. This is Jordan over here. And this is the area they were in. It's only a four or five mile difference between the Dead Sea and main population centers out in this area. But they were out in that area. And they were in a car. Diane and James. And as they're driving around on September 1st, 1969, their car got stuck. And they tried everything they couldn't get out. And to their luck, a couple of Bedouins came along and got them out. Well, a couple hours later, they got the car stuck again. And they couldn't get it out this time. And they were looking around and they found a cave along some rocky walls. And James sat down and told his wife, I don't feel very good. Remember that. Well, Diane said that she would leave and get help and come back. Well, this is really just a desert environment. It's brutal. And I'll give it to Diane. For a day and a half, she hiked across that desert. And she found the Israeli police. And they came back to the location where they left James. It was about a mile from the car to the cave. And during that mile stretch that the police were looking for him, they found something odd. In the desert, they found James' underwear. They thought, well, that's, that's strange. And Diane just shook her head. She couldn't understand why the underwear would be in the middle of the desert. And they kept going. They went to the cave. He wasn't there. A two-week search couldn't find him. And they essentially gave up. But there was a couple of Israelis that were persistent and they kept looking because they knew he was there. And one week after the search and rescue terminated, they found James on a ledge. And I'll quote the reports coming from Israel. It was at an inaccessible location from the ground. Did you catch that? Inaccessible. <laughs> The report said that he had to have fallen from above. Hmm, okay. They found James in a kneeling position with his head on a rock, deceased and naked. No bones were broken. And right near him, there were pools of water the only water in the entire area. So what did he die from? Everything under the sun, according to Israel. Well, he must have died of dehydration, but there was water there, so that doesn't make sense. Maybe he died of a heart attack, but that doesn't make sense. They found his passport and his wallet in the middle of the desert as well. The Israeli border guards and the Israeli police 
were the ones that really searched nonstop for this. What happened to James? Let's look at it from a 411 context. I've told you many times that the cases I work appear that the person fell. But James wasn't feeling well. He couldn't go on with his wife. He had to be in that cave. If he didn't feel well, he's not climbing. He's going to stay in the cave. So how did he get up to the top of the mountain to fall into this location? Well, that doesn't make any sense. So I want everyone to think about this carefully. James was super smart. They were there on a life mission to understand why Christ picked this place. Why? So why did he die? That's a really good question. And I could never understand the honest answer that Israel gave. But I can tell you it's strange. A lot of different versions about how he was found, where he was found, what he was wearing, etc., were scattered throughout different articles. I do think it's one of the strangest cases I ever researched. Now, when you add to that the disappearance of William Faber, the disappearance of A.M. Burroughs, well now you have three cases all involving leaders of the same church. Now, if I cluster all of those disappearances together and I say, okay, James Pike, William Faber, and A.M. Burroughs all disappeared in the same three-year cycle, I make news all over the world. But if I scatter them out 20, 30, 40 years, all of a sudden everyone forgets. Mark my words, friends. You will never have heard about these three cases being grouped together ever anywhere. But now, since I'm talking about it, you'll see all kinds of channels talking about it. And it's like they all did the research. Well, you can look all you want, and you're not going to find these three cases anywhere. But I, I don't doubt there's some relationship here that we don't understand. Why the Episcopal Church? Don't know. Why these three men? I don't know. Remember, James and Diane were together. James didn't feel well, and Diane left. Point of separation. William Faber and his assistant left. Point of separation. Ann Burroughs leaves the guest ranch she's staying at. Point of separation. Is it just all coincidence? Does it just so happen that the Episcopal Church happens to be the one that we're talking about? I know I have a very smart audience out here. So let's have a little homework assignment on this topic. Number one, when you make a comment on this video, please do one thing, because I think everyone would like this. Please put down where you're from. If you're from a state in the U.S., just put the state. If you're in a province in Canada, put the province. But if you're in another country outside of the world of U.S. and Canada, put the country. I'd like to see, and I think everyone else would like to know, where we're all commenting from and where are all different backgrounds. I've learned over the years, <clears throat> when I used to travel a lot as a policeman, I made it a point to go into police stations all over the world and just introduce myself. And I usually took a patch with me 
and I'd give it to them. I wouldn't even ask for anything in return. It's just goodwill. And police officers all around the world are different kinds of people. Some are ethical, some aren't. But they all have that ingrained police spirit, I learned. Now, when I was younger, I used to align with the Mormon church. There are Mormons all over the world, and they would always take you in and treat you well. And people's view of religion, whatever their religion is, is viewed from their perspective in their part of the world. So if you're an Episcopalian and you have an opinion about what happened to these three people, tell me, why them? Why your church, if this is your church? Why were they singled out? Or was this just all happenstance? Now, have other religions lost pastors, etc.? Oh, yeah. And I've written about them. But I've never found multiples like this. And this is unique. So your opinion is appreciated. If you're a religious scholar and you have an opinion about this, I want to hear it too. Just put it in the, up in the uh, response boxes of the video. And uh, understand, I don't push religion on anyone. Religion is a very personal thing that you need to come to on your own. And I've never believed that if you get pushed, you're going to accept it more readily. You have to be in that space of a head, in your head, to be ready to accept what it is. And at different times, maybe something will kick you in the pants and say, you know what? I need to look into that. Or I need to attend something. And then you know your time will come. If you're already in a church, I'm not going to tell you that your church is the wrong church. Just like Pike would say, Bishop Pike, he was accepting of everyone. I'm accepting of anyone who's a Christian and believes in God and Jesus Christ. I'm accepting of anyone who believes anything along the religious angle and is a good person. I'm not going to push my views on you. And I respect if you don't push your views on me. But I know from being around Ben that when he was with the Krishnas, they were very, very motivated to teach people about their world. And I respected that. They were respectful. They would approach you. They would give you a book. And they would ask you if you would like it. You don't see that very much, very often in the world of religion. And I never met anyone in that Krishna world that wasn't extremely nice, polite, and caring about people for what that's worth. So, special edition of Missing 411. We covered a lot of ground today. Um, I would greatly appreciate if this video could get some traction. If you could push this around to your various social sites, I would greatly appreciate it. Last thing, Twitter has changed. Twitter has changed. Since Elon Musk has purchased it, it has already changed greatly. And understand that it's time to come back, and I don't say that lightly. I've been there the whole time, it's been a war, war zone, but time to come back. I post there daily. David Politis at Can Am Missing. If you just look at, at Can Am, like Canadian American, at Can Am Missing, you'll find me on Twitter. And uh, there's a lot of really good people I follow on Twitter. Stay away from the crazies, and you'll find a very respectful, polite group. And on Twitter, if you come across somebody who isn't, you just dump them, block them, get rid of them. I, I, don't, I don't waste my time with people that are rude, crude just not me. I've got all of you out there to help. So anyhow, 
David Politis at Can-Am Missing. Some of you are still thinking that my books are $150 on Amazon and that's the only place I sell them. I don't sell my books on Amazon. I don't sell my books online other than through our website, $24.99 and $29.99. And you can buy them all day, all night on our website and it's listed right under the description of this video. Thank you for being here. I'm humbled that anybody wants to watch. Um, your friendship is greatly, greatly appreciated. And uh, I think about all you guys often and uh, let's, let's hope that uh, us strong people can help others to get through these tough times. When you leave today and you go outside and you're going to the store, look around, see who's around you. See who needs some help. Help them out to the car with something. Be nice to someone. It makes you feel good inside. Thanks for being here. Politis out.